everyone. If we can uh, get the last few seated, we'd like to begin. Uh, so thank you all for joining us on this truly wonderful day here at the Friday Institute. I know most of you, but there are a few I might not. So I'm Glenn Kleiman. I'm the executive director here at the Friday Institute. And it really is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this combination celebration. It's been 10 years since this magnificent building opened, and we're celebrating that. And we also have our annual award of the Friday Medal for Educational Innovation. And we also have, sitting in the front row, and I'll get to say more about them all later, the largest collection of Friday Medal winners that have ever been gathered in one place and at one time before. <laughs> So, and we'll, we'll learn more about each of them later on. Um, I'll come back at the end to say a lot more, but for now I'm really just, my job was to get you seated and start the program. Uh, Marianne Danowitz, our Interim Dean of Education, expected to be here today, but she had a valid excuse. Her first grandchild was born on Saturday. So she's in Denver uh, with, her with her daughter and grandson. And so Dr. Eric Wiebe will be representing the College of Education and that's very fitting, because as you'll hear more later also, Eric has been part of the Friday Institute since the very beginning. He's a professor of STEM education. He's a fa senior faculty fellow here at the Friday Institute. And he's now interim dean for research in the College of Education. And he's had one other role, but I'll save that for later when we talk more about the history of the Friday Institute. So with that, let me turn things over to Dr. Wiebe. Good evening, and uh, welcome on behalf of the College of Education and the uh, William and Ida Friday Institute of Educational Innovation. This is, a, this is really a very special evening. It's an honor to attend the presentation of the 2015 Friday Medal Award this year to Governor Bob Weiss. Uh, Governor Weiss's work has not only supported education, but also helped move it forward in very important ways, especially the work that he's done with the nation's high schools. As Glenn has said, the College of Education uh, has, and folks like myself, other faculty and staff have been in, uh, involved with the Friday Institute for quite a number of years now, uh, working on innovative approaches to educational challenges that we face in the 21st century. We're proud to have this well-known research center, all started over a decade ago by a group of faculty in Poe Hall with a grand idea. Those brainstorming sessions turned into planning meetings, which turned into fundraising goals, which turned into the building that we're now sitting in here tonight. Here we are, 10 years later, and the faculty and the staff and the students affiliated with our Friday Institute are still hard at work developing, evaluating, and disseminating cutting edge innovative approaches to the teaching and learning and crafting of key educational policy ideas. Our Friday Institute plays an important role in the education and innovation and improvement of North Carolina through the education, uh, educational research practice and policy. None of this is possible without the support of our friends and without the leadership of Dr. Glenn Kleiman, Executive Director of the Friday Institute. I also want to recognize and thank Provost Arden, Governor Jim Hunt, and others for outstanding leadership and continuing service not only to our college, but to the university in the state of North Carolina. And we look forward to your remarks later. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of the College of Education Advisory Board and the National Advisory Board for the Friday Institute for their support and service to the college. I see many of my North Carolina State colleagues and friends of education out in the audience tonight. And I would like to thank all of you for the support you provided us for the work that we do here, it means a great deal to me and to our college and the Friday Institute on this great occasion here tonight. Now it gives me great pleasure to invite Provost Dr. Warwick Arden to the podium. The North Carolina State vision and mission are inspiring to a campus and a community that continues the Wolfpack tradition of tackling the challenges of our time with intellectual rigor and boundless energy. Welcome, Provost Arden. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. Chancellor Woodson uh, regrets that he can't be here this afternoon, but I know he has a, a love and a passion for, for this event. 
uh, and this program. He asked that I share with you his excitement and his admiration for everything that the Friday Institute has achieved over the years. So today we come together for two great purposes. One is to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Friday Institute, and the other is to honor this year's recipient of the Friday Medal for Educational Innovation, Governor Bob Wise. As president of the Alliance for Excellent Education, Bob plays many roles in improving and updating education. One example is that he leads the national initiative to support schools becoming future ready, an initiative in which we are very pleased to have the Friday Institute as a participant. Bob brings a distinguished history to his work, including serving his home state of West Virginia as a US congressman for 18 years, and then as governor from 2000 to 2004. We will hear more about Governor Wise and importantly more from Governor Wise a little later this afternoon. And thank you, Governor, so much for being with us here today. We deeply appreciate it. But first, I'd like to say a little bit more about the Friday Medal and the Friday Institute. We present the Friday Medal each year to honor the memory of Bill Friday, a man whose legacy will always be part of NC State. NC State's College of Education named the state-of-the-art educational research institute after Bill and his wife Ida to honor the Friday's unwavering commitment to educational excellence and to equity. Each year, the Friday Medal is awarded to, in their name, to recognize an outstanding leader in education, one who shares that unwavering commitment, who has made important contributions to education and takes the collaborative, inclusive approach that Bill Friday demonstrated every day as his, in his 30 years as president of the UNC system. It's a pleasure to join you here today to celebrate the 10th anniversary and the opening of this state-of-the-art institute as well. It's a pleasure to welcome two representatives of the Friday family, the Friday's daughter, Lila Friday. Thank you for being with us. And Mr. Friday's long-term assistant, Virginia Taylor. Thank you for being with us today. Although she can't be with us this afternoon, I'd like to also recognize Anne Goodnight, who with her husband, Jim, was instrumental in the creation of the Friday Institute and continues to serve as an active member of its National Advisory Board, as well as a member of the NC State Board of Trustees. Because Bill Friday's vision and approach is ours as well, the Friday Institute is a center for collaborative work, bringing together researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and business leaders to help create the next generation education systems for pre-college students. For example, the Friday Institute team just completed developing the K through 12 digital learning plan for the North Carolina State Board of Education. This plan defines directions for updating and improving our schools in order to prepare all students for college, careers, and citizenship in a global, technological, and indeed rapidly changing world. As part of this major initiative, the Friday Institute is working with the state's principals and superintendent associations to prepare our schools and district leaders for roles in creating future-ready schools. The Friday Institute also leads the North Carolina School Connectivity and Cloud Computing Initiatives to ensure that every school has internet access and resources necessary to provide up-to-date education for students across the state. This work has been foundational to our contributions with Governor Wise's organizations to the National Future Ready Schools Program, in which the Friday Institute team helped design and facilitate the regional institutes held throughout the country, the first of which was held here in the Friday Institute. There are many other examples of the Friday Institute's accomplishments, and just to name a few, leading the development of the state's 400 million race to the top proposal, and then helping evaluate the many initiatives, helping create new programs in global literacy, digital learning, principal preparation, and in colleges of education, coordinating the digital transformation of education cluster in the Chancellor's interdisciplinary cluster hiring program, conducting groundbreaking work with colleagues in computer science and the applications of artificial intelligence in education, 
conducting research on innovative approaches to STEM education, and providing MOOCs, or massive open online courses, for thousands of educators across the country and indeed around the world. So the list could go on and on, and these are just some examples of the work the Friday Institute does to empower educators and students to be 21st century leaders and learners. This work makes NC State extraordinarily proud and indeed is worthy of the Friday name. In honor of the Friday Institute's 10th anniversary, I'd like to recognize some of those individuals who contributed to the creation of the Institute and are still involved today. So I'm going to embarrass you uh, as I call your name. Uh, please stand and then at the conclusion we'll recognize you. Uh, Hilla Spies, Hilla, uh, was the founding director of the Friday Institute, professor of education, and currently a Friday Institute senior faculty fellow. Phil Ema, Director of Technology Planning and Policy. Dave Fry. Dave uh, was a graduate assistant 10 years ago and is now Associate Director of the Friday Institute. <laughs> Ellen Vesu. Is Ellen with us? Uh, Ellen, as many of you know, led some of the Friday Institute's projects as department head and is now Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Jenny Korn, a research assistant in those early projects and is now the Friday Institute Director of Evaluation Programs. Sam Snyder, is Sam with us? Associate Dean, I'm, I'm just getting worried here now. Sam and Ellen and Marianne. <laughs> you know, uh, Sam uh, is Associate Dean for Research at the college and was acting director of the Friday Institute in the years 2006, 2007, and has done a wonderful job and made many wonderful contributions. Lily Colasso, Assistant Dean for Finance, and Margaret Penny, Executive Assistant to the Dean both of whom have been in their roles in the College of Education since before the Friday Institute opened. Eric Wiebe, Professor of Education and Senior Faculty Fellow at the Friday Institute and now serving as Interim Associate Dean for Research and Acting Dean today. <laughs> Eric and I were just chatting out there. He's Acting Dean today and the Chancellor's out of town, so I'm Acting Chancellor, so <laughs> we're trying not to let it go to our heads here. Gail Jones and Holly Lynn Lee, professors of STEM education and senior faculty fellows at the Friday Institute. Bonnie Fusarelli, professor of educational leadership who began the Northeast Leadership Academy, the NILA, at the Friday Institute and now leads this program within the College of Education. And while he's only been here eight and a half years, I'm going to recognize Glenn Kleiman. Uh, Glenn, I think you've packed in 10 years worth of work uh, so we're going to recognize you. Glenn has done an amazing job since he joined us in 2007. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have done incredible work. Thank you so much for what you've done. <laughs> Finally, I have the honor of welcoming our great former governor and dear friend of mine, who happens to have the same name, by coincidence, is that amazing library down the road. Isn't that, isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> you all know how fortunate we are in North Carolina to have his leadership and how much he has contributed to improving education in this state and the nation. Among his many, many awards was that he was the recipient of this award, the 2008 Friday Medal for Educational Innovation. Please join me in welcoming a dear friend of NC State, a dear friend of education, a friend of North Carolina, the great Governor James B. Hunt. Thank you very much. Well, I want to observe to begin with that having been called out and having stood up by our provost, so many people here have a great future in academia here at this university, my university, my school of education. 
And as I was looking up here, Governor Wise, uh, I, I thought about the fact that there is what you're going to get today. This wonderful uh, uh, ribbon and the, the medal. And as I walked out of my bedroom this morning on my cattle farm, right there beside the door is my medal. <laughs> just like the one you're going to get. And I just left an office I have here in Raleigh where I keep pushing for education and progress. There was a picture of me and Glenn Kleiman and Bill Friday as I received this award. There are only two pic three pictures in that office. That's one of them. So I want all of you to know that I am truly delighted to be here. Pleased to see all of you. JB, I helped you in your campaign. You didn't quite make it. But you know, I lost one one time. <laughs> And I want to say to all of my friends here at NC State how proud I am of you. When I was a student here in education, we didn't have this big a faculty and all these great people. We've got the chairman of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. Happy to have her here. And we appreciate the work that we do with you all. But I just want to say to all of you today that this is a, this is a wonderful day an appropriate day for us to be here and to be celebrating. I'm always pleased to be with my provost. We're so lucky to have this man and we have fought to keep him. I want to tell you universities all of America have tried to get him. And the chancellor has been successful and I've been right behind him. And uh, we really are fortunate to have you. Um, I'm here today to do to do two things. One, to congratulate the Friday Institute team for all the work that you all are doing. It is amazing. And the people in North Carolina don't know all that you're doing. I want them to know it. They're learning it, and they will over time. Tom Williams, you'll have to help us tell this story. But I'm going to be doing all the telling that I can, too. To congratulate the, the Institute team for all you've done over 10 years, 10 years, you all actually got this started and moved forward with great progress even after I went out as governor. <laughs> of course, if I'd been governor when you started, you'd have moved faster, but <laughs> I'm teasing you. You couldn't have done any better. And I'm very proud of all of you. And we've got a lot left to do, an awful lot left to do. But the good news, folks, is that we can do it. All of us working together and caring as, wide, as we do. This institute is a great resource. And we sure don't have to tell this to Governor Bob Wise, who will be receiving your great award today. But uh, here, you have this wonderful, strong leadership that the uh, provost has recognized, led by Glenn Kleiman, who is an amazing leader in this field. He's been teaching me. I'm not a very fast learner in this particular field, but Glenn, I'm making a little progress. Keep helping me. Uh, this wonderful staff that you have. We didn't used to have that. No other university in North Carolina has that. Provost. Uh, we have uh, strong partnerships that uh, many of you represent, working with our, I uh, see the head of our principals association back here and our, our uh, <coughs> superintendents and the teacher organizations. Wonderful staff, the great partnerships that you built. We get things done with partnerships, people. We don't just hold forth up here, even on a great campus. And, and, and get things done out there. That's one of the things that attracted me about North Carolina State. I got two degrees here before I went to law school at another institution I will not name. <laughs> but I like the way that we got out in the field. We learned the, 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 the problems and the challenges and the needs. And then we tested out our theories. 
we thought they were pretty good, but we tried it out. And we helped people, and we measured how we helped them. I appreciate that, and that's what you do here. And of course, you've had strong state and national recognition, as the provost uh, pointed out, and received some wonderful funding uh, that is very impressive and good for North Carolina. So I am pleased to join you today to celebrate the 10th anniversary uh, of this wonderful institute. Uh, you are the envy of colleges and universities around this country uh, in terms of the work you do. Uh, I was recently out at New Mexico State University. Anybody in this room know where New Mexico State University is? Three of you do, that's good. 50 miles north of El Paso, by the way, if that'll help you. The president there is a good friend of mine, former colleague, uh, governor, friend of Governor Wise and mine. And he asked me to come out and keynote a big, uh, a big symposium they have, much like our Institute for Emerging Issues and our Symposium for Emerging Issues. And in the course of that, after consulting with Glenn Kleiman and getting his good help, I held up a brochure publication by this institute, which spells out how you need to do the kind of education work that you're doing here, digital learning, and the approaches that we're taking in North Carolina to that. And it is a wonderful plan. And I want to tell you that the lawmakers in this state have in effect said to the Friday Institute, what do we need to do? How do we need to do it? Tell us. And you've told them. And they put it, they are putting it in, into place. We need more resources. We need to keep working at it. And we need to keep working with those people out there in the field. You don't just do it on a campus. You've got to have the leadership there, the vision there. You've got to be preparing students there. We've got to do all this great work. But uh, you are doing it. So I had this brochure from NC State University. Really, you all wrote it. Uh, it's a North Carolina, state of North Carolina brochure. So I held it up and told a thousand people there at that, uh, at that symposium about the work being done here and the approach we were taking. And then after that, and after a little lunch, I sat down with the governor, Hispanic woman governor of New Mexico, and I spent an hour and a quarter showing it to her. So there will be no excuse for New Mexico not doing this right. <laughs> and that's all true, by the way. Now, uh, another example of your wonderful work is the fact that next month, uh, when the Hunt Institute uh, puts on the Holzhauser Legislative Education Retreat, which we do for legislators every year, uh, three presenters, Dr. Bonnie Fossarelli, Dr. Mary Ann Wolf, and Dr. Glenn Kleiman will present the work in this field and where we are and where we ought to be going to the legislators. Of all, we, p we pick out the best people in America to come and present and help educate the legislators and encourage them. This is the best, and we're proud to have them coming. So I congratulate all of you who are part of this and urge that we keep moving forward strongly. Now, I'm also delighted to be here today to uh, celebrate my fellow governor and good friend, Governor Bob Wise. He is a West Virginian. Uh, I started to say he had the good sense to go to Duke University. Indeed he did. A great university that, that attracts great students. And here, in addition to getting a, a wonderful education, he got involved in politics, in building things, in providing opportunities for people. 
in moving states and communities and nations forward. And he worked with people who were doing that kind of work. Uh, he worked with a great man named Howard Lee, who then was, had been the uh, mayor of Chapel Hill, as many of you know, and, uh, and ran in the state senate, ran for lieutenant governor. Uh, he worked with the great Terry Sanford, and he and I share Terry Sanford's views and commitment and determination and hard work. I'm, a, I'm afraid a lot of people don't understand how hard public leadership is, but uh, it is, and we have to do it. So this is a man uh, who came here, was a great student, uh, a great congressman for many, many years, and then became governor of West Virginia. He did it all. He did early childhood education. He did raising standards. He did measuring and accountability. Uh, he obviously has done a work in this field of uh, digital education in a marvelous way. His organization, Alliance for Educa Excellent Education, is the leading organization working in this field in America, folks, if you want to know who that organization is. He's a wonderful leader. He's worked with every state in America. Good friends with our mutual friend Jeb Bush, who's given wonderful leadership in this field. So Bob Wise is, is a great story. Uh, in addition to that, of course, he is now the chairman of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. And uh, that's something I had something to do with initially. <laughs> Chaired the group that formed it for two years. Took a lot of time to, to get everybody together on that. And we formed a board that had a majority of teachers as the, as the members of the board. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I chaired that for 10 years. So knowing that this fellow has come out there with all that he's doing, that he was willing to take the, the chairmanship of the national board and give it wonderful leadership is something that's good for America and something I appreciate very much. And we're proud to have Peggy Brookings here today and I'll be with her in the morning. So Governor Wise, uh, you're gonna have other people presenting you. Uh, but I want to congratulate you on being the 2015 recipient of the Friday Medal for Educational Excellence and Innovation. If this, if this medal has ever been given to somebody who has worked their head off and changed education and kept pushing, I like those people who don't retire who keep working, who've learned a lot, and then get out and try to teach others and keep moving. This man is the epitome of that. I am so proud of him. West Virginia and North Carolina and all the states of America are so proud to have him. So he'll be presented in just a moment, but I want to tell you all what we have here today, the great leader that we have and we're so thankful for him. So now let me turn this back to Dr. Glenn Kleiman, and I will sit down so I can cheer this great leader. Thank you all. Well, there certainly is no one who can make a special day even more special than Governor Hunt. A wonderful, amazing man, certainly the claim that, that he's learned from me, one of the great privileges I've had in this role is to get to know Governor Hunt and before he passed away, Mr. Friday. <clears throat> and they're both incredible mentors. And I'm sure what I've learned from them is far more than Governor Hunt would ever learn from me. I did have the pleasure of introducing Governor Hunt in this room some time ago to a group of principals. And I thought and thought, how do I get up here with my Brooklyn, Boston accent and introduce Governor Hunt to a group of North Carolina educators. And after pondering that really late into the night, 
I got up and I said, friends, you all know Governor Hunt. You know how much he's contributed to this state, to this nation. <clears throat> you know how much he respects teachers and educators and how valuable he's been to every student. Please just join me in thanking Governor Hunt for all he's done. And I think we should take another moment to thank Governor Hunt. <laughs> Okay, it's, he's also a difficult person to follow to a podium. <laughs> I once had to do this between Governor Hunt and Mr. Friday. That was very intimidating, but we'll move forward. And uh, some of the things I, I had planned to say, I'll move over quickly because the provost and the governor have already mentioned that. Um, let me first thank the provost, Dr. Weavey, um, Governor Hunt for being here today and speaking at this wonderful event. And, um, I want to go back a bit in our history, since we're saying this is our 10th anniversary. I'm just trying to figure out, does an institute have anniversaries or birthdays? It seems sort of like that thing of corporations or people. It feels like the institute is really a, it's a collection of the people. Um, so whichever it is. And I want to start off with this picture of Hill Aspires in Bill Friday, <clears throat> which I'm told was taken in 2004 at Poe Hall. Here's a reminder, while we are taking the when this building opened in November of 2005 as our official start date. Obviously, a tremendous amount of work went on before that. Uh, Hill Aspires, Dean K. Moore, and many others. The planning of this facility, the fundraising was an enormous challenge. I was fortunate, I came after the building was built because I know something about programmatic work. I'd have no idea how does one go about building a building like this. It's really an incredible um, success and an amazing addition to North Carolina NC State. So just want to acknowledge, <clears throat> and even before the building was built, the work of getting an institute approved in the university system, the provost probably knows that's not a simple thing, and beginning the programmatic work and getting funding. So we're picking a, a, the date of the building, but lots and lots of good work went on before that. And I think there's just a, a wonderful picture of the two of them. And I think they, well, Hill is still here smiling, but we know Mr. Friday is smiling about the work we've done and what's been accomplished. It was interesting to get some of the pictures from the early days. So 10 years ago plus, we were a sign and there was a lot of machinery running around here. And Mr. Friday came to check that everything was going okay. And over that year, the scaffolding began to go up and Mr. Friday checked and came to make sure everything was going okay. And then we began to look a little bit like a building and Mr. Friday came to check <laughs> that everything was going okay. The man was involved, this is not just a name, this institute meant a lot to him, and he made sure we, we really did things right. Here's a picture. People recognize those folks. Uh, Phil Emer and Andy Overstreet. It's Andy's retired now, and he and his wife, Carol, are traveling the world, so he's not here today, but Andy was the um, director of operations for a number of years. And there they are. Phil looks a little bit younger there but, um, as the building was built. And then this is a favorite one. Remember I said that Eric Wiebe had some other roles? <laughs> the faculty were committed. They were gonna make sure this building was built and wired up, even if it meant climbing through the ceilings with the wires. So that was your other role, Eric. Another picture we really enjoy. <clears throat> and this is the ground cutting. Um, the provost mentioned Ann and Jim Goodnight. Um, Ann had, is unable to be here today, but has been at every other Friday medal event and serves on our national advisory board. And Anne actually comes to the meeting, stays all day, contributes, is incredibly thoughtful, and has been so helpful to us in so many ways. This picture doesn't have Anne, but at the, your left is Jim Goodnight with Mr. Friday. To the back is the then Dean K. Moore, a Mrs. Friday, Jim Oblinger, who was then the chancellor, and the other person who I didn't know, who Hiller knows who that is, the last person in the picture, Hiller. David Jolly, who is on the advisory board. Um, so this is the, the, op the cutting of the ribbon, and that led to the Friday Institute with the motto of inspire, innovate, educate, 
with the tasks that we've developed in our strategic plan of helping to create the next generation of education. And we don't say schools because some of that's in schools, some of that's outside of schools. To serve as a center for collaboration across disciplines, and we're very pleased to work with the chancellor and provost on the interdisciplinary faculty clusters, <clears throat> and to work across the research, practice, policy, and innovation perspectives. And this is very deeply important to us. There are so many places where the researchers are here and the practitioners are there and the policymakers are there and these innovators are out in California, although we have a ton of them here also. And really, we work very hard to bring those together and to tackle large, complex problems, as the provost mentioned, like creating the state's digital learning plan, like working with the future-ready schools that will serve education. So a very quick summary of our mission. And the provost really said enough about these things. We're very pleased to have um, developed this plan. We worked with educators throughout the state very closely, with business leaders, with the legislators, and some of it is being funded, some of it isn't, but we really think it sets the groundwork for lots of what will happen in this state. And Governor Hunt, I do have, to, I can't just say governor anymore, we have two governors sitting here. I do have to tell you, we've heard from New Mexico, we've heard from Utah, we've heard from Virginia. There are 46 more states, and I'm sure if you got on the phone, we'd hear from all of them. <laughs> But we are become really working across the nation and working across the nation, as was mentioned, with Governor Wise's organization on the Future Ready Schools program. So we can skip over that. There's a number of other thanks we'd like to give. We thank those who have been around here for 10 years. And I think it really says something about an organization when you have a group of people who helped start it, who are still there 10 years later. But really, this organization, it's this wonderful building, but much more importantly, it's the amazing people and the incredible dedication they show, the ownership of the work. When I join meetings here, I'm always amazed at how deeply every staff member owns the work they do. And I think we need to take a minute and ask all of the Friday Institute staff to stand and be thanked by everybody. Call everybody up. And I'll have to call out two special people on that because they stood because they now are members of the Friday Institute staff, but we also have two of our former deans of education, Jose Picard and Jane Fleener, who were both wonderfully supportive of the Institute while they were deans, so supportive that they decided to join us and now work with us on a number of projects. So thank you to Jane and Jose. <laughs> We also have a national advisory board. Uh, we actually put this together after I arrived because we had one that really was primarily North Carolina and just kind of had lost energy. And this is an amazing group of people. I have this idea of an advisory board. You'd get some really smart people together um, and then you'd set up some sort of rotating thing and every, they'd stay for two or three years. And we found that this group was so engaged and so helpful and so dedicated to the work that we've kept them and they've stayed with us all of these years. And we have folks here like Ron Bailey from the University of Illinois, Shelley Goldman from Stanford, um, Sandra Nettles from Illinois, Jim Pellegrino, who's a leader in learning sciences at University of Illinois. We have folks like Ann Goodnight and Steve Rasmussen and Sam Morris, who's from Lenovo from the business side. We have practitioners like Bert Lohm, who's now the superintendent of Durham. Bill McNeil, who's sort of a practitioner, a policymaker, a guru of many things. We'll come back to Bill later. Uh, Shauna Young, who's a remarkable young woman, was one of the first Keenan Fellows, was a teacher in Durham and is from North Carolina, but is now director of outreach at the MIT School of Engineering. J.B. Buxton, who's another one of those policy, practitioner, research kind of folks. We only have several members of the advisory board here, but if I can ask for them to stand and be acknowledged also. We really appreciate all you've done. <laughs> and it's another group that, that really has helpful every year helping steer us and just such a thoughtful, wonderful group. We're not letting you guys go. You're stuck with us for as long as we can have you here. Um, Okay, we also, we don't have to applaud because they're not here, but we've been very successful in diversifying our funding. And of course, we greatly appreciate all the foundations, the federal agencies, the businesses that are providing support for our work. Um, okay, there's so many good things today. One of the other pleasures today 
is that we have the Friday Institute Graduate Student Fellows Award, which we began three years ago as an, a new award to add, because we knew on Mr. Friday's passing his deep commitment to students and how much he valued students at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level. And we thought this was a fitting award to add to give to one or two young scholars who are nominated by the faculty fellows at the Friday Institute each year. Each recipient is an advanced graduate student at NC State who's beginning his or her dissertation work, has a strong academic record, and has been actively engaged in the work of the Friday Institute. And we know that they're really all at the start of an outstanding career contributing to education one way or another. In addition to the recognition, which is a good thing, uh, the award also provides some funding to support their dissertation research, travel to conferences, and the kinds of things that can help folks at that stage of their career. And while we have many fine doctoral students, and we wish we could give this award to all of them, we're only able to select one or two this year. And I'm very pleased to announce that this year's recipients are Rebecca Height and Jennifer Lovett. And let me just say a few words about them. Uh, before we have them stand and be recognized. We'll see if the pictures match them. <laughs> Best pictures I could find on the web. Rebecca Hyatt is a PhD candidate in science education and Dr. Gail Jones is her advisor. And Dr. the advisors were very, very supportive. This one I have to read carefully. Her dissertation research examines emergent 3D haptic enabled virtual technologies and their affordances of learning with younger students. What that means is she's investigating some really cool new technologies. Uh, Rebecca has taught high school science and ge geography for 13 years in Chapel Hill Carborough schools and for the North Carolina Virtual Public School, so also has explored online teaching. She's received national board certification. We've got a couple of governors who really like that, as well as the head of the organization here. That's a wonderful thing. Was awarded a Keenan Fellowship and served as an Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow which is a congressional award in Washington, D.C. Uh, this summer, she's been accepted into the North Carolina Education Policy Fellows Program with the Public School Forum, which is a great program, which we sent a number of our staff. She helps coordinate the congressional app competition with Representative David Price and Nano Days with Dr. Da Gal Jones, connecting STEM professionals from local industry with students. So a wonderful set of activities from Rebecca. Jennifer Lovett is a PhD student in mathematics education with Dr. Holly Lynn Lee working as her advisor. Her dissertation research examines the preparation of teachers to teach statistics effectively. It's a cross-institutional study that find, identifies factors of content knowledge and teaching efficacy for pre-service teachers. Before coming to NC State, she herself was a high school mathematics teacher for seven years in Ohio. And she's been very, very engaged in teacher development at NC State, and has continued that work recently in working on the design and implementation of a MOOC for educators on teaching statistics through data investigations, as well as working on the teacher education curriculum, which we're in process of getting online. It'll soon be available to everyone. I'm preparing teachers to teach mathematics with technology, an NSF-funded project led by Dr. Lee and Dr. Karen Hillbrands. So let's have Jennifer and Rebecca please stand. And I think we should ask Gail. And I was trying to sneak in, I think we should ask Gail and Holly Lynn, their advisors, to also stand and be acknowledged for the great work they do with the students. A lot of speechifying, Bob. We'll get up to you. Don't worry. Be patient. <laughs> okay. Friday Medal for Educational Innovation. Ten years of awards. And here, I'm going to take a few more minutes. I know we're, we're running over time, but I ask for your patience. And I want to talk a little bit. This is the last main thing before we introduce Bob and have him speak. Talk a little bit about the Friday Medalists, because I think they really represent the Friday Institute the kind of work we do, the kind of people we want to work with, and the way we combine research, practice, and policy, um, which is reflected in the wonderful people we've selected. So our first Friday medalist, and let's, we'll have them all stand at the end just to kind of move things along. So we've got, as I said, a, a collection of them up in the front here, was Ken Branch, who is the founding principal of the Centennial Middle School next door, 
and contributed a great deal to the creation of the Friday Institute. So Ken starts things off. He really represents for us the grounding of the Friday Institute in the day-to-day -day work of schools and how important it is for our teams to deeply understand and stay grounded in the school realities. So while we work on research and policy, we always come back to day-to-day -to -day life in the schools. Betty Manchester, who's unable to join us, was the director of the Maine Learning Technology Initiative. When I got there, we were just beginning. People remember eight little pilot schools that were given one-to-one -one computing uh, by Governor Easley at the time with uh, Jim Goodnight's support and Golden Leaf Foundation. Um, so we brought Betty down and she called and said, is it okay if I bring Angus along too? So I had the pleasure of having Governor Angus King come along and talk about what it really takes to, for technology to be successful. And they both emphasized something that remains important to us. It's about leadership. It's about preparing and supporting teachers. It is not about devices and wires. You need the devices and wires, but it's certainly not sufficient. And Betty's been a wonderful mentor to me for many years. Don Wu, who's with us today, and I've known Don for many years also, and Don picked a, such a fascinating research area. He's a researcher at the University of Connecticut, but his question was, what does it mean to be literate in the information age? And he's done really important influential research when people talk about things, well, the young people are digital natives, they all know how to do this. Don's research says, well, they may be digital natives when it term, comes out to sending IMs or playing games, but we really still need to teach them to use these technologies to gather information, to organize it, to critically analyze it, and on and on. So Don's played a very important role in the field of literacy and bringing it into the digital age. It's great to have you here, Don. Governor Hunt, he's our cleanup batter. Notice he's fourth in the list, I think in terms of baseball terms. Nobody's had more impact than Governor Hunt, and no one has inspired us more, and just having the man here is so inspiring uh, to keep the work going. We could go on and on, but I think we, everyone knows, Governor. Uh, Chris Deedy, who is actually on an airplane trying to get here, hopes to join us for dinner. Chris is at Harvard University. He's a national leader in the field of education and technology. He's perhaps the most influential person in the field in very quiet ways often. He's a prolific writer. I'm sure if there was a Guinness World Book for serving on the most advisory boards, Chris Deedy would hold it. When I came here, um, Hillis Byers and Dean K. Moore had searched for consultants to help them think about the Friday Institute, and they had found Chris. When I went to EDC in 1985, one of the first things the president of EDC gave me was some papers from Chris because he'd helped them form what was the Center for Learning Technology then. And in fact, I'm here because when I decided it was time for a change, I mentioned to Chris and he said, well, there's this place called the Friday Institute, maybe you want to check out. So Chris has had lots of influence. There are folks in the room who Chris has influenced that dissertation work and, and many aspects of that career. Linda Darling-Hammond from Stanford, a brilliant researcher whose work on leadership, on professional development has influenced so much of what we do. She was Obama's advisor <clears throat> during his campaign for education and has now started a policy think tank in Washington with a number of the really strong policy thinkers from Stanford and elsewhere throughout the country, and just an amazing woman who has influenced so much. In fact, I have to say, when, when Linda was receiving the award, Governor Hunt was there, Mr. Friday was here, and I got to say we have sitting in the front row three people who advised every president on issues of education, from Lyndon Johnson to Barack Obama. It's a pretty amazing uh, event to have. Um, Dr. Bill McNeil, who's joined us today. Most of you know Bill, former superintendent of Wake County, national superintendent of the year, who really made Wake County a model district. And Bill is just the great, we, you know, Bill always jokes around, it's hard to be serious with Bill, but we learned so much about how to, how to work together. I mean, he's so, it's an incredible facilitator, makes every group he works with better. We worked with him closely on the Race to the Top proposal. He was then the, was it, director, president, whatever the title is, of the uh, North Carolina School Superintendents Association, and is always available as a friend. He's on our advisory board here. He's on the college advisory board. He's just an incredible asset to the state. It's great to have you here, Bill. 
Dr. David Rose was unable to join us, but he's the founder of CAST, and he would never take credit for it, but he's really the creator of the concept of universal design for learning. And I remember first meeting David up in Boston, and his basic message was, if a student is not succeeding, it is not because there's something wrong with the student. It's because there's something wrong with how we go about teaching, and that we have approaches to teaching and materials that are accessible to some, but not all. And the whole idea of universal design for learning is how do we make learning available and accessible to everyone? Very, very important work. I wish he could join us today, but he wasn't able to be here. And a good friend, Bob Tinker, who is here today. And I don't know if Bob remembers when we first met. I think it was when I came to Boston about 1985. And I went over to another organization that in some ways was probably a competitor where I was, but none of us really cared. Bob certainly didn't. And Bob was there with an Apple II computer opened up, and he was soldering up things, and he was creating these probes where you could measure things, and he was making software you could pull the data in and make graphs. And he said, Glenn, with this, students of any age can do real science. And the whole idea of students doing real science is such a powerful one. But Bob's always been in the lead. I remember Bob coming over and talking about this other crazy idea he had, creating a virtual high school and letting kids learn online by setting up a collaborative network, uh, which is certainly, I think, was, as far as I know, the first to do so, or one of the first. And then he showed up one day with this Newton. Anybody remember the Apple Newton device? And OK, the device didn't make it. But Bob was seeing the future of mobile devices in education, and the list goes on and on. So it's great to have Bob Tinker here with us today. And finally, Muriel Summers. It's great to see you, Muriel. Muriel is such a delight. Yeah, most of you know she's been the principal at A.B. Combs for a number of years. Muriel tells the story much better than I can, but she really had this idea that every student, we're talking about elementary grades, is a leader. And she went and, as she said, stalked Stephen Covey till he would work with her and work with her on developing the Leader in Me program, which is now used in thousands of schools throughout the country. And so we really come back with Muriel to being grounded in schools, deep respect for students and teachers. And just, uh, if you haven't visited A.B. Combs, go do so, because it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful place. It's been the National Magnet School of the Year twice. And Muriel just, she reminds us again and again. I've been there when she had a big event. There probably were 100 adults in the room. But the idea of a teachable moment, Muriel to a student who was struggling to speak in front of the, the group. And she just stopped and she coached the student. It didn't matter what the schedule was. It didn't matter how many people were there. That student had a teachable moment. And Muriel does not let that go by. The other thing I'll always remember Muriel took me in her office and she kind of uncovered this big graph. And we do a lot of work around the use of data to inform instruction. And we see lots of graphs with lots of points that represent kids or little x's. Muriel doesn't have a graph like that. Her graph has a little picture of each student's face. Because you never forget in her school that it's each student is a real child. And they're not a dot on a graph. They're face on the image to move forward. So it's wonderful to have Muriel, another one. All of these people inspire us so much. So with that, we're going to welcome Governor Bob Wise to the club. Lots has been said about Governor Wise. We've been delighted in working with him and his organization. And Bob may not remember. I seem to remember when I first met people. He, I bet you don't remember when we first met Bob. He said a Knowledge Alliance meeting. It was a meeting of groups of folks who were running the regional labs and such organizations. And there was this friendly guy who just was so interesting and had all kinds of ideas just in working groups. Finally went to Jim Comus, the head of the meeting, and said, who is that guy? He said, oh, you don't know, that's Governor Bob Wise. And I thought he was some education professor somewhere. I didn't know. He's so knowledgeable of education and so engaged in all the issues of education. And at the time, I just thought, well, he's a great person to have a conversation with and was very pleased years later when we had the opportunity to really work closely with them. I think Governor Hunt has told you about his organization, the Alliance for Excellent Education, which really plays such a central role. I'm scanning to see what hasn't been mentioned. I don't want to be too redundant. Bob's the author of a wonderful book called Raising the Grade, How High School Reform Can Save Our Youth and Our Nation. Um, he's led the Alliance 
since really 2005, so about the same period. Things like Digital Learning Day, um, Project 24 preceded the Future Ready Schools, things that really brought to many, many people the idea of how important digital technologies can be in teaching and learning. Um, as governor, he really, he did a lot of the things in West Virginia Governor Hunt did here, focusing on early childhood education, pay for teachers, opportunities for students to go to college. We won't go through the whole list, but he really, I think we could, I think, and I know Governor Wise would, would appreciate being compared to Governor Hunt, certainly. So we think of you as the Governor Hunt of West Virginia. Um, <laughs> I hope Governor Hunt thinks that's okay to say too. Um, Bob's won many, many awards. Um, and he's just been so influential. And currently now, as, as Governor Hunt mentioned, as chair of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, he serves on the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation Commission on Standards and Performance Reporting, on the Gordon Commission, which works on issues of the future of education and assessments, the National Sciences Research Institute, and the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. So he's really all over. I was just out at the Hewlett Foundation Grantees Conference in the last two years, and Bob serves in his own words as the MC and makes the conference really a delight. His wife, Sandy, and lives with him in Washington, D.C. They have two grown children, and among everything else, he's a black belt in Taekwondo. So a remarkable set of credentials. We could go on and on, but we won't because we want to hear from Governor Bob Wise. Thank you, thank you very much. Wait, what a, I've got to tell you, this, um, this is getting me a little more than I thought it would, and I'll share some of the reasons why. It's an honor, first of all, to be here. I think you may have noticed a pattern, though. I just, I've got to get this out front. So Governor Hunt gets up every morning and looks at the medal that he got seven years ago. And incidentally, Governor, I'm going to be honest with you. When I get up, probably be Friday morning and look at it, I'm not going out to feed the cattle. It's 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> like you are. Uh, we got other cattle we try to move and herd in, West, or in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. But you may have seen a pattern. So he got it he was seven years ago. You may have noticed that... Um, uh, I'm very proud of the fact of what we've been able to do in West Virginia. Uh, we started a four-year-old program for four-year-olds. It's actually getting uh, several folks have just come recently to do case studies on. I signed that legislation in 2002. Governor Hunt had Smart Start well underway. Uh, I'm very proud of the financial aid package that we have in West Virginia, and I had a hand in creating uh, part of it for and West Virginia has one of the uh, most extensive financial aid packages in the country, particularly given our economic capacity. Uh, then I'm, I'm talking, to, and one of the things we did was we created a scholarship that you could use at private institutions as well as state, and I thought we were one of the first. Of course, Governor Hunt created that uh, many, many years ago. And the list goes on and on. I'm, I'm chair of the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards for seven years. Governor Hunt created the National Board <laughs> for Teaching Standards. Uh, and so, the, as you can see the pattern here, we're all fortunate to follow in Governor Hunt's footsteps. Because what I have learned is, I've learned several things. First of all, when Governor Hunt calls you, you can say no <laughs> once, try it twice. You're going to end up saying yes. And so just say yes and be happy with it and understand that it's an even better opportunity. But the other part of it is, is that I've, I've learned the importance of always learning from Governor Hunt. And that I, former, I'm going to be real frank with you. Um, I've observed this in my life. Former governors have a pretty brief half-life, uh, particularly in terms of being recognized. Now, I went, I created this scholarship, and I was home last year with some friends and we were on the campus of one of the institutions that uses the Promise Scholarship a lot and my friends, uh, there was a co-ed there who has a scholarship that I helped create and they called her over and said, uh, do you know who this guy is? And she looks at me, now admittedly I had a little more hair back then, but she looks at me and of course she was 
in Governor Hunt's Smart Start program, or the equivalent of it at the time when I was governor, she looks at me and says, oh, were you the Oric vacuum cleaner salesperson? <laughs> Now that's what happens to most of us mortal governors. Does not happen to Jim Hunt. Does not happen to Jim Hunt. Because not only in, in North Carolina, but wherever he goes. One thing you know is governor, most governors are term limited. All the governors that I served with are out of office now, and the governors that certainly that he served with are out of office now. There's only one former governor that I know of in this country that when he calls a current governor, they answer the phone because they know that he knows what he's talking about. And that's, for, and that's Governor Jim Hunt. So, Jim, Governor, I just want to say thank you because you, you've been an example of what we can do and continue to do once we leave office. So thank you. And thank you to the Friday Institute for this, for this award. Now, I just, I don't, I've got, a, and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I am shaped, molded, created by West Virginia. And I am very, very proud of West Virginia and a lot of what we've accomplished in people. And I, I know there's some West Virginians here, and I want to say thank you for being here. I say that, and I also say, but I'm also proud of the fact that I have been prepped by North Carolina. I'm a drop-in. I drop in frequently into North Carolina. I dropped in 45 years ago to go to college. And incidentally, Governor, I know that I've got a checkered past in, in, in some people's eyes. I just want to record my sister went to UNCG. Um, but I, I dropped, and incidentally, you exaggerate a little bit. If I'd been a better student, you said I was a very, very good student. I got better later. If I'd been a better student, I would have been at UNC Law School, but I didn't, didn't get in. But so, but I dropped into, what, into North Carolina. Yes, I can see the West Virginia, North Carolina. I dropped into North Carolina 40-some years ago, almost 50, I guess. And I soon learned something. Uh, as I was just coming of age to appreciate what was going on around me. I heard some names. Frank Porter Graham, Terry Sanford, Bill Friday, a number of other names that are famous in education, yes, in North Carolina, but nationally. And I soon realized something, that this was a state that had built itself on education. That as Terry Sanford, Push forward and K-12, there had already been established an incredible higher ed system in North Carolina. And I realized the importance of education because I had, a, when I was 16 years old, I ran for uh, political office. Oh, well, I mean, I ran for governor when I was 16. I was a child prodigy. Uh, <laughs> actually, I ran for governor of Boy State, and I lost. And I lost to a young man uh, that's, his slogan, education is the only passport from poverty. And he was right in 1965, and he's every bit as right today. And so, and I used his slogan 30-some years later. <laughs> uh, but so dropping into North Carolina, I saw what leadership could provide. And I saw the importance of education in creating opportunities. I saw what a Terry Sanford was doing. I saw what a Governor Holzhauser was doing. I saw what a... Uh, 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 I saw what other governors were doing. I, later, as I dropped in much more frequently uh, in the last few years, I saw Governor Purdue be involved in connecting up and working with the Friday Institute. I've seen what the current, current uh, leadership is, Gov uh, Representative Horn in the legislature, one of the true uh, advocates for digital learning and technology in schools. And so I've seen that. And then, of course, there's always Governor Hunt to, to look to. So. North Carolina has always, to me, been one of the leaders in this, for North Carolina, yes, but also for the nation, in what leadership and education can do for its citizen. Now, we're, North Carolina's been through some momentous times, as my state has been. When I, when I came here my first time, things were going great in the coal industry, the chemical industry, the steel industry. Yours were going great in the tobacco industry, the textile industry, and the furniture industry. And today, of course, we've all been through massive shifts. Some of those still exist, but they don't exist in the numbers they do, and, they don't, and now you have to have a much higher skill level to work in them. And so shifts have occurred all along the way. What has, I think, propelled this state is it's all constant, continuing focus on education. Because you know what my first job was after I graduated from a four-year institution just down the road in Durham? 
I got a temporary job in something called, that was just developing, called the Research Triangle. And my job was, incidentally, I learned the power of higher education because I went out there and I was stamping out, there weren't many companies out there at that time, this is 1970, 71, and I'm stamping out circuit boards, first early circuit boards. And I sit there and I'm making, and it, it was minimum wage was $1.50. And they, so when I got my check, I looked around and there, I checked with the worker next to me and there were several, you know, a couple hundred of us, and most of them made a dollar fifty. I got a dollar sixty-five. And I said, "Why did I get fifteen cents more an hour?" They said, "You have a four-year degree." But what that that early circuit board manufacturer, which then turned into SAS, GSK, Lenovo, you name it, IBM, you name it. That's what propelled. And what is it that drew them here? Yes, there is. It was basically an education system, a higher ed system that was creating uh, incredible minds and, at the same, and an education system that was supporting it. So these are momentous days again. And I just want to talk to you for a moment about the four drivers of change, because we're facing these right now. In 15, I see a former superintendent whose work I've always admired, uh, Dr. McNeil. He knows that he and his 15,000 colleagues across the country face decisions have to be made in the next couple of years. Actually, I would suggest to you in the next year or two. Here they are. First of all, every state and has now enacted much higher standards and expecta academic expectations. Whatever you call them, common core, standards, uh, uh, college and career ready, every state in the union has adopted some set of college and career ready standards. That's all within the last five years. And incidentally, what's the expectation? That they be applied to all students. Not the 10 or 15% of us in 1965 that were able to get this, but to all students. And incidentally, our businesses and our, and our workplaces now, and not just our workplace, our society's demanding not just that you know, that you memorize some things, that actually they tell you not to, what they, what they want us to do is, our students to be able to do is to have core academic knowledge and join that with the ability to think critically and creatively, to create, to work together in teams, to be able to solve problems, and to be masters of your own learning because the one thing that's certain is you're going to have to learn how to learn. You know, the child that's sitting in a classroom right now, 65% of the jobs that they'll be working in, we don't know what they are, but they're going to be there. And so preparing those students, I've heard a fascinating statistic the other day, a student that's a freshman in college right now was born the year Google was created. And what that means then is they have grown up not trying to memorize everything, but they've grown up in, a, in an era of searching for information. And how do they search for it and how do they apply it? That's what we need to, it's what our educational system is. So higher standards and expectations. Number two, constrained budgets. Anybody flush around here? I haven't noticed it for a while in almost any state or the nation. And so classic, classic innovation situation, higher, higher demand for much greater results and less money to do it with. Third factor, equally important, changing role of teaching, not diminishing the role of teaching. The teacher's role is enhanced even more. I'm so fortunate to be with Peggy Brookins. The, CEO of the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, which Governor Hunt created, and which North Carolina, I might add, has the highest number of National Board certified teachers. But the changing role of teaching, and how is it that we help our teach, give our teachers, listen to our teachers, number one. Number two, give them what they need to meet all these challenges. And third, help them define the profession, their profession. And the fourth one, and the game changer, and why the Friday Institute Friday Institute, not me. The Friday Institute is so important is the changing role of technology, educational technology, which is now interactive, sophisticated, much more so, much come a long way since that Newton, haven't we? Um, uh, sophisticated, and I might add price points are dropping. And so that mobile device, that, I, that tablet, that whatever, that was unthinkable to a, to a district or school budget just a few years ago, now is the price of a textbook. But you, this isn't just about, but that's the critical point. You can't just layer a Chromebook on top of a textbook and say, voila, 
we got technology. This is about planning what you do. And this is about a new era in education, an exciting era to me. It's enhancing the role of teaching. Teachers are going to have the tools they need to truly individualize and personalize education. But it's about planning to do it right. We have a mantra that we've developed at the Alliance and with Future Ready Initiative, which is plan before you purchase, don't purchase, and then plan. And what that means is, and that's why North Carolina, once again, providing that leadership. I look around and I see the leaders in so many different areas of technology, whether it's talking about the, the software that, that, that SAS and uh, Friday Institute have worked to, to develop a digital dashboard, whether you're talking about interactive learning, whether you're talking about the data systems that enable a teacher uh, through the dashboard to personalize and identify each student's strengths and challenges. Whether you're talking about the, yes, the one-to-one the -one device and what's the best one to use it. Whether you're talking about a number of different educational, of technology innovations, but how it's all integrated to truly create that learning experience that's so important. And what is at the center of all of this? It's not about the technology. It's not even about the adult. At the center is the student-centered learning. What is it that that, you, that student needs? And then let's plan around it. That's what Future Ready Schools is about. And thank you to the Friday Institute and to Glenn for, for stepping up. We had the privilege of, at the Alliance for Excellent Education of working with the Friday Institute uh, early on in a planning to help district, school districts across the country plan. Uh, Friday Institute, of course, brought the experience they developed here in North Carolina. And so we had that exp of helping school districts plan how to, uh, use how to use technology and plan in a systematic way. And when the U.S. Department of Education came to us and said, we would like for you to coordinate the Future Ready Schools initiative, hold, 13, hold 12 regional summits across the country, develop the planning process. Incidentally, let me just tell you, when they say we want you to coordinate translation, we want you to do this, and we're not giving you any federal dollars. <laughs> uh, but that's okay, because it was an amazing opportunity. And so, whom is it that we called on first when we had this opportunity? It was the Friday Institute. And where was the first of 12? Actually, it turned into 13 regional summits across the country, reaching 462 different school districts, totaling six million, almost 6 million students. Where was that first one held? in this room, two days, North Carolina, South Carolina, and, a few, and some other. Uh, uh, I see a number of folks that were so actively involved, and Sarah Hall, the head of digital learning for the Alliance for Excellent Education, sitting next to Mary Ann Wolf, and that's another daggone thing you did. You recruited Mary Ann uh, 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 from, from the Alliance, but, but it's, a, it's a far, far better place you go. Um, you did what, and we're all fortunate in, in the privilege of working. But it was the Friday Institute we called on. It was the Friday Institute that was at every one of the 13 summits. It was the Friday Institute that helped put together the program. It's the Friday Institute that's helped, that has developed the MOOC for educators that has now success, gone through several iterations and, and reaches thousands. It's the Friday Institute that if, you got, if you've got a technology or innovation issue or about, learn, about learning, it's the Friday Institute that you call. So a lot's been done, but we can't rest. You remember those four drivers. Well, they're driving, they're driving us faster and faster to make these decisions, to help with the planning, to make sure that we're able to reach every child with the kind of education that's so critical. We have to meet students where they are. And with technology and the innovations that are developed here and, and pioneered here and piloted here, we can. And, and then finally, it's about listening so much to the teachers and hearing what they have to say. So this is a, a very meaningful, and I have to tell you, emotional uh, moment to be, to be in North Carolina, uh, to be receiving an award that I'm, I'm looking at name, people whose names I have been reading and known. I don't know everyone personally. I do have the privilege of having, of course, Governor Hunt. Uh, I have one person who tells me what to do Officially, that's Linda Darling-Hammond, who's, who's on my board of directors, and then Governor Hunt, whom I just call in and check in to find out what to do. Uh, 
but, but to be with this group, and then also to be with the Friday Institute, because I want to come back to where I started, which is always a good place for a former politician to end. I want to come back to where I started, and that is the importance of, this, of the Friday Institute and the leadership that this state of North Carolina has provided. Yes, you've provided it to generations of students in North Carolina, and a number of us who came to take advantage of it. Incidentally, when we come to take advantage of it, we usually pay you back because there is not a time that goes by, a month that goes by that I'm not talking about what is happening in North Carolina in some way or where one can benefit or where one can grow. The Hunt Institute, I've never seen an organization that has brought more governors and more future leaders of this nation to North Carolina to understand better what's happening in North Carolina and to take it back and implement it where they live than the Hunt Institute. And so you've, North Carolina has always been the leader, and so to, to me, to one of the leaders in this country. And so to receive this award from one of the leading institutes in North Carolina is incredibly meaningful. So I want to thank North Carolina and the people of North Carolina for what you have done over the many years to make this possible. I want to thank um, I want to thank the Friday Institute for the opportunities to partner so often and for what you provide. And finally, I want to thank all of you, including the Friday Institute once again. I want to thank all of you for what you have done. I also want to thank you for what you're going to do. It means it, thank you very, very much for this privilege. Team or Friday medalists, join me for one moment. Come on up, guys. <laughs> That's you guys. No, and Governor Hunt. Like, yeah. Governor Hunt, please join us. We've, we've, we've never had the opportunity to have so many of you here, but I thought it would be great to have all of our former recipients present to join me with this great honor, Governor Wise, of presenting you with the Friday Medal for Educational Innovation for 2015, and welcome to this esteemed club. <laughs> Okay, and if uh, the good night can join us, if the folks in the front can join us for a couple of quick pictures and others, please join us at the reception, and the rest of us will be there in a moment or two. So thank you all very much.